and welcome to the Success with Savita podcast. I'm very excited to have you here today because it's. A, I know I'm looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be very different from the ones I'm used to, and it's a huge honor to have you here. I've been reading your uh, bio. I've been looking at your work. You've had such an illustrious uh, career. So welcome to the show and welcome to our conversation. Hey, thank you, Savita, and the pleasure is all mine. This uh, subject is quite dear to me, and so I'm looking forward to talking about it. Uh, um, so yeah, feel all free. Right. <laughs> with that, let's dive right in. Uh, like we say, let's start with your journey and your story and what brought you to the role that you handle now at Badwani Foundation. Well, um, you know, I basically did the typical engineering um, undergrad at an IIT and then I went off and did my master's in the US um, and, and then did my first set of entrepreneurial, I worked for a little bit and then I did my first set of entrepreneurial stints in the US. Uh, in fact, along with my brother-in-law as a co-founder, and uh, we did have some early successes. And in fact, one of the startups that brought me to Bangalore to do the usual thing that was to start a software development center. I mean, I, little did I know how much India had to offer. And um, uh, we, we, besides just doing software development, we actually ended up doing a whole bunch of other things like, you know, inbound and outbound marketing. Uh, tech, technical support, finance, even sales outside the US and many other functions besides the software engineering that a typical startup uh, goes off and does. Post that particular startup, I did a slew of other startups. Um, some of course were great successes and some others were miserable failures. Successes of course um, tends to keep you going um, and of course the failures you take it with a stride and I, I let them become great learning lessons for myself. My last startup, um, which got acquired by a Chicago based company, uh, I was with them for a couple of years and, and it was during that time that I decided that, you know, I've done a bunch of startups, had a few successes, it's time to give back. And I decided that my next startup would actually be around creating impact. And um, while I was trying to brainstorm a bunch of different ideas and modeling out different um, startups around agritech and fintech and bunch of other things that I tried to do and I, I realized that you know it takes five years to do a startup and and um, uh, you know at the end of five years you realize it's a success or a failure and for however much experience you have it still is always a challenge right so uh, but along the way I got a call from a search agency a executive search agency and they were um, it was for Vadwani foundation that they were looking for somebody to sort of run a bunch of their initiatives and also run a global technology platform across 20 different countries that they have. So being an entrepreneur myself, of course, uh, I would have not given it a second shot. But upon learning the mission and the kind of impact that the foundation was making, I did decide to pursue it. Um, and one of the, you know, obviously one thing led to another, but um, a final conversation with Ramesh Wadwani and Ajay Kela, I got convinced that um, this would be perhaps the best way to do a most meaningful, impactful startup that I could ever do. And, and, and then, of course, um, in the kind of initiatives that I was going to run, it would keep me close to the startup ecosystem and the SME ecosystem, uh, which is what I cherish being part of, because that's what I've done throughout the, my life. So that's how my journey with Vadwani Foundation started. I hope that kind of answers um, uh, what you're looking for. Yes, and I think I know you've like really put it down in the, in the shortest possible, uh, you know, sharing of your journey. And I know that there's so much to it. Of course, we'll unpack some of that along the along this conversation. But at Wadwani Foundation, you have a strong focus on women entrepreneurship. Um, can you share with us the big picture thinking behind this? While a lot of people are getting into this space, we are putting a huge amount of focus on female entrepreneurship. How do you feel that female entrepreneurship impacts the Indian economy, society, and communities? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question, uh, um, Savita. I think uh, women entrepreneurship is actually very dear to me um, and in, in a way very personal to me also. And in fact, it is to all the employees at Vadwani Foundation. But I, I say personal as one of my software, one of my first, soft, soft, well, not my first, the third software startup which went on to become successful was actually started by my wife. Um, her name is Kalpa and she had absolutely no background in software products or software engineering, but her sheer grit 
and determination to do something radically different made her build a really fine software company. She went on to employ close to about 200 uh, engineers and in fact managed to convert and originally what she started as a software services company into a product company um, and then that became one of the first few product companies out of India. So I think uh, that is why it is very personal to me. But as such for Vadwani Foundation, uh, we really strive to support entrepreneurs because they are job creators who, make, who can make a significant positive difference in emerging economies like ours. Now, if you let's, let's talk a little bit more about the women entrepreneurship side. India has close to about, um, I would say about 430 million working age women and about 14 million women owned businesses that are out there that provide direct employment to more than about 25 million um, employees. 25 million people, right? However, very interestingly, a number of the enterprises that are reported as women owned are not really controlled or run by women. It's a combination of financial and administrative reasons that leads to a woman being reported as a on paper uh, owner with little role to play in the, in the organization. Um, now, if you, um, according to, in fact, McKinsey uh, Global, India can potentially add close to about $700 billion into, our, uh, into the global GDP by increasing women's participation in the labor force. Um, in fact, by, by McKinsey itself, um, according to them, more than 44 more million, incremental million women will actually enter the workforce by 2030. So, so I mean, it's, it, these are huge numbers, right? So I feel uh, that when women entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, women become entrepreneurs, they make a huge difference in more ways than one. Not just the economy, but, but as you rightly pointed out, even in your question, um, that they bring about a transformation at a societal and community level, right? When you provide equal access to inputs, women-owned enterprises produce equally strong, and it, this is no, uh, I mean, it's world over, right? I mean, they produce equally strong economic outcomes when compared with enterprises that are led by men. So it's not like there is any kind of inferiority over there. Um, and what entrepreneurship does to w women is um, something radically different, right? Which is they end up playing a pivotal role rather than just um, a peripheral role uh, in the economic sphere. Um, in fact, women that, that work, they often start creating a very cascading effect for other women. Um, so what I mean by that is women are more likely to hire other women um, and are less uh, influenced by gen gender stereotypes. Also, as uh, women entrepreneurs experience greater financial independence, autonomy and, and control, it leads to an increased retention of women in the workforce, which is again very important because a lot of women, they come into workforce and then they have to leave very quickly. A majority of the women you know, believe working for themselves reduces their dependence on a spouse or family and, and therefore an, an equally large number of them also view it as a means to break through the glass ceiling, which is, which is always something that they are under. So a woman founder, um, a woman founder is also more likely to implement programs to encourage other women with potential through, you know, skill set building or, or training to become ready to take on more responsibilities at a higher level in the organization, including some of the revenue generating roles uh, in sales, etc., which, which oftentimes in India, at least you don't find a lot of women doing. And then of course, as a women founder, you sort of are more empathetic towards the challenges that are faced by women, the other women. Um, and, and, you know, you, you tend to propose uh, fairly conducive policies like, uh, you know, maternity leaves and extended maternity leaves adoption policies, building of crashes in the nearby areas, or it could be just a break uh, for a menstrual leave policy, right? So I mean, a lot of these things like that. Um, and here I'd like to point out a particular example uh, of a company. Um, it's called Pick My Work. It's called Pick My Work. It's a startup supported by the Wadwani Foundation, and we did that last year. Uh, it's a gig platform um, that gives businesses an online demand sales force on-demand sales force. 
Its co-founder is a, a lady called Kajal Malik, also a board member and the director in the company. And she ensures that they have more women gig workers. That's the, that's the whole vision, right? Creating more gig workers. I mean, because you see a lot of men as gig workers, but you don't see as many women. She pushes for targets for getting women gig workers on, on their platform. And so this, this is really, this, the, we are starting to see the shift happening firsthand when we work with some of these women founders. Yeah, and, and, and one last thing that I wanted to mention is that um, in order to encourage women entrepreneurship, we, we sort of need multiple factors to work in cohesion. I mean, it's not just one thing here or there, but it's like, you know, expansion of mentorship and networking channels for them. Um, you know, tailored knowledge and capability building, um, which of course at Vadwani Foundation we do. And an enabling and comprehensive policy framework uh, that gives equal access to finance and cultural openness, right? So, I mean, these are some of the things that are very, very important for, for women entrepreneurs. I think you've captured everything that makes the case for uh, investing and building you know, women entrepreneurship in not just our country, but across the world, because these are things that we try to uh, capture. I'm going to, you know, borrow your answer because you, you've touched upon the whole uh, gamut of right from how, you know, women are able to bring in more diversity because they hire other women. And that's so true because so many businesses that we work with, they are looking to hire more women. Fascinating insight into what Vadwani Foundation is doing, especially with the fact that we're going into the gig economy as well. So my next question to you is, what are some key trends you are seeing in the growth of women entrepreneurs and the ecosystem? Like, are there some things that you're noticing, especially in the last, I would um, touch upon the last two, three years because, you know, we've had COVID. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, again, a great question. I think uh, the pandemic, uh, of course, has seen more and more women um, sort of taking on entrepreneurship, uh, some by necessity and, and some by, you know, by choice, of course. The country has, of course, um, witnessed uh, the most women-led startups turning into unicorns in 2021. Uh, we all know about some of those. Uh, I think some of the major startups in that area where they've actually turned into unicorns uh, are run, that are run by women are, of course, Nika, which is also popular uh, by Falguni Nair. And then you've got Mobiquik, uh, which is uh, by Upasna Taku. And, and a company called Zolo Stays, uh, which is um, Sneha Choudhury. In fact, yourstory.com, um, which is run by Shraddha Sharma, is run by a woman also. And, and now it's become a household name, right? I mean, every startup wants to be, be part of yourstory.com and they want to be featured over there, and at least amongst the startup um, community. In fact, Shraddha, uh, I was talking to her a couple of months back, and she has now started a new community in her, in her platform called herstory.com, which is, which is all about um, creating uh, women-led stories. Another story comes to my mind, and this is a young friend of mine, uh, Neha Bagaria. She runs, uh, uh, you probably have heard of her. I mean, she runs this um, uh, platform called Jobs for Her, which is India's largest career platform to accelerate women's careers. Their vision is to really enable women to achieve their full potential by enabling them to start, restart, and then rise in their careers. Um, now, often successful career women, you know, at the prime of their careers get stuck at home or have to go back to home due to having to move because they just got married. Some event, life event happened, maybe they had kids and therefore they go back to, to their homes and, and want to take care of their kids. Or it could just be taking care of older parents. I mean, you know, and all of these uh, uh, unfortunately bring their careers to a grinding halt oftentimes. Of course, things have changed now with remote working and all of that. And, and I think that definitely helps uh, that end of it. But, but, you know, assuming that they can't do the, the remote working and it really brings their career to a grinding halt, then when they're ready to go back to work years later, and it could be several years later, it becomes extremely difficult. And, and this is where I think a company like Jobs for Her comes into, into, for rescue with them because it really starts by helping such women to restart and repurpose themselves. I think it's a fantastic idea by a fantastic entrepreneur. You know, so hats off to her, what she's done. The other trend that I'm also seeing is that in the last few years, E-commerce and social commerce have boosted women's entrepreneurship to a very large extent. For example, last year, uh, you know, obviously Misho 
reached the milestone of nine million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's a household name again. Nine million women entrepreneurs on their platform, right? And with more than about 60% of them, they were coming from tier three um, towns, such as Dimapur and Faizabad and Haldwani. I've never even heard of these towns, right? And, and so I think it's becoming clear that the will and the tenacity to work hard and, 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 and work hard and then grow are very much there among women across the country. Um, what is also happening as a trend is that you're also starting to see lots of more women uh, get into the whole venture capital world, right? So you have, um, you know, obviously you have Padmaja Ruparel, who's part of Indian Angels, uh, right? Mani Kola, who's Kalari Capital. Uh, you've got Ankita Vashisht, uh, who's a local Bangaloreite over here. You have Paula Bariwala, who's uh, started the seed fund, um, the Stanford uh, Angels. Shanti Mohan, who's doing, you know, again, very disruptive stuff. Let's Venture, which is bringing lots and lots of startups and VCs and investors together onto one platform. And it's great because women founders often pioneer newer markets and fulfill very untapped customer needs through very innovative processes that are sometimes very related to what women like to do anyway. Uh, and, and the examples for that would be platforms like beauty, uh, beauty products uh, for beauty products and, and women-focused business um, um, schools or eco-friendly sanitary products maybe, and, and maybe even innovative kitchen products, right? So, um, and, and these uh, businesses often tend to foster a lot of business innovation and address largely unmet and, and, uh, and an often neglected need that is out there in the market. And VCs who are women uh, VCs uh, certainly are in a better position to understand the gap and, and to the potential of such innovation. So I think uh, these are some of the trends that are happening, which is great for our country. Uh, but unfortunately, there are 44 million incremental women that are going to get into the workforce by 2030. So unless we have lots and lots of jobs for them, uh, it, it may not be the right thing for them at that point. So I think it's very important that we do something about it right now. Sure. And I'm so glad you brought up about, I, these are like really interesting trends and I think you're bang on about all of them. And interestingly, while you're mentioning about investment, I made my first, uh, uh, you know, angel investment into a beauty brand called Ready, Set, Jet last year. Uh, it was a group of uh, female investors who invested in a female-owned brand. Um, and talking about funding and VCs and this whole space, access to funding is the biggest hurdle faced by you know entrepreneurs and in particular women entrepreneurs we know what the numbers are in the industry so how does one actually create an investable startup i know it's a very broad question but if you could share one two three things that someone should keep in mind while creating such a startup um, from your experience yeah so I, you know before i get started on that i just kind of remembered uh, when you said you invested in angel um, um, angel invested in a woman-owned startup um, you know, so for example, when I was talking about jobs for her, right, I mean, my, my wife who started that startup and we exited it successfully, um, she took a break for almost four or five years uh, after that, right? And, and now she's again embarked on, on a new startup idea, which is very women focused, not, well, not entirely women focused, but, you know, it's into wellness centers and spas and, and, and beauty salons and all of that. Um, but, but it's, you know, it does become a challenge when four or five years later, you want to get started again. But again, that, uh, the, I'm just fascinated by the grit, uh, and, and motivation and, um, the ability to get kickstarted right back into where you were, you, you had been a while back. So just wanted to mention that, but, uh, yeah, going back to, uh, access to funding, I mean, um, you know, having uh, run um, multiple startups myself and having created a few successful startups, um, um, I'd like to highlight maybe um, a few ingredients, um, maybe two or three, that I believe create an investable startup. Now, this is there's nothing earth shaking over here. Everyone talks about it, and this applies to anyone, um, women or men founders. Um, and, and I want to briefly touch upon also the women founders and perhaps what is required off of them. But I think in general, for an investable startup, you certainly need to have a great execution team. VCs absolutely look out for robust, well-rounded teams with complementary talents. Um, you know, you're always at risk and you would always be doing hard selling if you're a solo founder. You need, you need a team, right? 
nobody knows everything, you know, and and single person always becomes a risk. So at an early stage, of course, you have no real assets. Your your team and your people are your real assets. So um, so to, to bring about the team together, creating the right culture, very very important. The second one, and again, the most critical thing in in running anything that is investable is creating great product market fit. Um, you have to build something that people actually want. You have to be able to demonstrate that you're solving a real and actually a growing problem that make the people use your product and also want to pay, pay for it because unless they're going to pay for it, you know, it's just a fluff and it's a, it's a kind of a free product that you're giving away and it will only last so much. Um, um, and, and then of course, you know that VC is always back, uh, back growth, really high growth startup. So the rest always becomes PR. But um, so one, one really needs to talk to customers, get them a deal, but get them to show, show you the actual money. Because unless there is money in, in what you're trying to do, you know, all, all hell breaks loose, right? So you, you VCs love that, that you're creating something that, that is um, actually going to bring in money. And then the other thing that VCs like to see, and because they are, they are data crunchers, they, they believe in what they see in data. Uh, you have absolutely have to have tons of data ready. You need to keep a lot of the me metrics handy while talking with them. Uh, it could be, um, you know, unit economics. It could be around funnel metrics. It could be around your CAT to LTV uh, ratios. Uh, uh, it, it could be uh, revenues in differentiated dimensions. Um, could be by, by headcount, by time, by campaigns, you know, whatever else. And, and why, why do you need all of this? Well, VCs love data. And, and um, you know, they also want to know that you're tracking what matters the most. Because if you're tracking thousands of other things that don't really matter to the business, it's pointless. So you really need to track what matters most for the business, the kind of business that you're running. And then going beyond these three things that are in general true for every startup, as far as raising funding as a women entrepreneur, um, there are a few things that one women should always keep in mind. I think um, you have to build a network, right? And, and women often tend to be, uh, have great people skills and, and they're good at networking in general. Um, and, and if you are indeed good at that, then you have to use that to your advantage. Uh, and before you start fundraising, know what the, you know, what it means to, to raise funding, know the, the networks that are out there. Um, in fact, find women angel investors if you are at that startup stage and trying to raise feed funding. I mean, there's lots of angel funds um, and women-owned funds that are there, which which would be would 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 love to see women-based ideas. So I think essentially one really needs to do their homework properly. The other thing is that um, you know women need to believe in themselves, right? I mean, they need to believe in themselves and their business. Um, you, they need to show their expertise, their confidence and their grasp of numbers um, because, um, uh, you know, essentially they are the, their business, right? I mean, it's, it's really them that are actually creating that business. So from the eyes of the investor, woman who's running the woman that's running the business is the business. So, so it's really important that uh, uh, they, they exude that level of confidence. And... Um, and of course, one should remember that the VCs are investing in, in, the, in that particular founder and therefore that founder's idea. So they have to get convinced about, um, about that particular idea. And then finally, like I said before, I mean, you know, you need to know your numbers really well and, and, and be very confident of those figures and the numbers that you're churning. Fantastic tips. Uh, I'm really glad that you touched upon having data metrics and, you know, tracking your data, because I feel like this is often something that a lot of business owners miss. And especially I feel it's so true for small business owners. People think like I'm just starting out. Uh, I'm still in my first year. Do I really need to, you know, keep all these, uh, you know, dashboards and stuff. And then finally, when it's time to actually look at growth, that's when they have to go in number crunch and then they don't have, they haven't tracked it. They don't know where to find it. They don't know. So it's, it's really 
really like putting yourself a little bit out of the game and then you know kind of starting over so i'm really so glad that you touched it so thank you for sharing that and i want to ask you because you have seen so much you know so many entrepreneurs so many stories is there a specific story of transformation or impact that you would like to share with us the audience of how entrepreneurship created the impact that you've seen maybe at the grassroots level maybe at a different level but during the course of your work yeah so i think uh, you know i was talking about earlier i was talking about social e-commerce right and and i think uh, that's an area that is becoming critically important um, and also for us it's really really important because it creates a lot of jobs right i mean you know when you're an e-commerce platform it requires a lot of people a lot of uh, large execution teams etc so one of the startups uh, that the vadwani foundation has supported um, uh, and and this startup has certainly had uh, a phenomenal impact and changed many uh, lives um, and this one is called um, uh, sirohi um the founder is a, a lady called uh, gauri malik i don't know if you've heard of this company but um, um yeah she she saw the opportunity gap in rural communities where people have immense talent but the lack um but but they they, they lack the chance and the skill to showcase that talent and and through her startup she really focuses her efforts on design and craft to create an exclusive range of products that wouldn't just be functional but would also serve a purpose um she really began making these products in just january of 2019 in in muzaffarnagar um which is in uttar pradesh and their work started with just one woman simply because the rest of them refused you know in the rural rural communities um, you see that a lot of women are discouraged from working and so a lot of these women refused and so she was the only um, she this lady was the only one that was working with her however once they realized that this was a legitimate source of income because that is the biggest fear is this legitimate right is this am i doing the right thing working and as soon as these women um, in the in the town they realized it's a legitimate source of income more and more women join gauri and today they of course have a strong hold of more than 200 women working with them as a as financially independent equals in their community which is fabulous there is another one which is of course again in the uh, social e-commerce platform um that we were actually supported we have given them a grant um, of course today they don't need a grant they are out to raise uh, millions of dollars now um, i wish it was an equity grant that we had taken but no it was a grant um um this is a company called frontier markets and um, the the person who runs that uh, company is uh, a lady called ajeta shah she returned from new york uh, several years back Uh, to start this um, um you know this social e-commerce platform uh, what they do is again they build it's kind of reverse of what sirohi did uh, they build strong rural marketplaces that connect rural customers to quality products and services so here they are actually instead of um taking their products to the urban regions here what they are doing is they are connecting to the rural uh, customers and bringing quality products high quality products from the urban areas into the rural marketplace and so their mission um, if you look at their website and i just looked at it um, some time back is their mission is to really help 115 million rural consumers join the online market uh, experience with a powerful sales force of 1 million digitally savvy women who they call as uh, sahayatas um and uh, it's a very unique concept i mean these women um, uh, they were uh, you know they were into agriculture they were earning 10 15000 rupees a year um which is no small amount for for somebody uh, in the in the rural side of things but today they are earning a lakh 2 lakh 5 lakh rupees uh, on commissions and on salaries being sahayatas in the and selling um, you know becoming digitally savvy and selling uh, goods to the uh, rural uh, customers Yeah, and they get to create impact as well because uh, I mean, look at the social impact that they're creating. Absolutely, you know? I mean, it's uh, I find this extremely inspiring and and a very accurate representation of how women entrepreneurs can really contribute to boosting the economy and transforming entire communities on a simultaneously. I mean, she's spread across the uh, she's in a lot of different um, rural areas and communities, and and which is fantastic. 
Wow, nice. I love stories. So those were really good stories. I'm definitely going to look up uh, Frontier Marketing, you said. So I'll definitely look them it's up. It's called Frontier Market. Uh, Frontier, Frontier Market. Market. So if you just okay. do a website search on them, you'll, you'll find so, it. And we'll drop those links with the interviews. So for listeners who are listening in, go check them out and spread the word, of course. And with that, um, I know you've already touched upon this in our earlier question, but is there anything else that you'd like to add to this question, which is what is one thing you wish women in business knew when they start out? Um, like common mistakes maybe that you've noticed that they make, which you wish they knew prior to starting out. So, you know, um, I think the first thing is that I've seen some phenomenal women entrepreneurs who somehow underestimate their value. Um, and and we, we, know, we all know that there's a wage gap in most countries, including in India, of course, more so in India. So I think women, sometimes women often fall into the trap of just talking what is offered to them with gratitude, right? In order to truly succeed in business, I, I, I think what women need to, to learn is to need, need, need to really own, own up to who they really are and really need to recognize their capability. Um, women should really be asking or demanding what they need to be successful um, and not just take it for granted and then basically, you know, ask for help and, and, and take it in form of gratitude, right? I mean, um, you, you have to, again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, you have to believe in yourself and be confident of what you are. I think that is, that is one, one area that I think uh, is, is very important. And, and I think the, the secret to scaling up isn't usually about doing more of what you are doing and working longer hours. Um, you know, it's really finding the right internal systems and processes for your finances, uh, financing, the finances itself, um, the marketing side of things, the sales and operations is crucial. Women often tend to be perfectionist. They often take on a lot more onto themselves. Um, uh, they, even though that they have the ability to delegate, I mean, they're above a million dollars. Of course, they can delegate uh, a lot of the functions to others uh, who are perhaps better than them uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. But oftentimes women don't end up doing that because they feel that they can do it better themselves. And, uh, and perhaps that's because they are perfectionists, right? So I think they need to sort of um, move away from that. So I think I would, I would just leave it at that. Yeah, you're talking to a recovering perfectionist, so I hear you loud. <laughs> and to all the people at the back again, quit being a perfectionist, uh, take it from the man himself. And you have been a serial entrepreneur, Mr. Shah. What, what is like a, one of the best business lessons you've learned from your own journey? Yeah, and, and this, uh, uh, this I can say because um, it's kind of related to my last... Uh, uh, one of my last startups, uh, and, and I, I think um, it will keep reminding me all my life. Um, don't build a business just because it's exciting or it is at the leading edge of technology. I'm a technology guy. I mean, I, I love things that are the leading, uh, sometimes at the bleeding edge of technology, like a metaverse type of a thing, you know. But don't build a business just because it's exciting. Don't build it because it's at the leading edge of technology or it is considered to be state of the art. That just doesn't work. Um, instead, you want to build a business that is single-mindedly focused on solving the needs of your target market and holding true to its true value proposition. So again, like I said, I mean, an example of what not to do is one of my startup ideas. Uh, that sounded like a great idea, very disruptive, very cool. And we thought it would be the best thing since sliced bread, right? I mean, and, but at the end of the day, um, while all of the above that I just mentioned were all true, it was, it was exciting. It was kind of sexy. I mean, it was uh, very cool. Um, it didn't really solve the pain point of the customer or it was too overcrowded a market. Um, we were not able to come out uh, uh, differentiating ourselves and pitch, I mean, that 30 second pitch is very, very important. People talk about a 30 second pitch, unless you're able to convince somebody within the 30 seconds that this is a good idea, it's not worth it. Uh, so it's very, very important that, um, uh, you know, you solve a, a business problem. And, and ultimately, you know, obviously we had to get exit out of that business. We, we got, uh, um, you know, we managed to sell it, but not very successfully, right? So, um, so that's, that's one thing. The second lesson, of course, um, is a myth and I think I, 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 this is again a very very important thing and this may be very difficult to explain it in a short time like this but 
it's a myth that you need a very highly experienced domain expert if you want to build a business around a certain very disruptive verticalized uh, sector. Um, so in fact, uh, it's just the opposite. Um, for example, if uh, let's say, take an example of a logistics startup, right? Um, you get a very highly experienced logistics person, somebody who's been there, done it uh, 15, 20 years. Um, you will never be able to build a disruptive idea as the traditional way of doing things in the age old uh, business um, that logistics is will always get in the way of creating something that's disruptive. In fact, it's good idea to bring in somebody fresh, um, give them, show them the problems that are there and solve it using non-traditional ideas that are highly disruptive. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm making myself... No, uh, you know, a great yeah. advice. So you're saying I still, there's still hope for me, even though I'm a business coach, to go into crypto and try to sell some specific crypto, even though I know nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> All right. As long as it solves a business idea, not just because it's crypto. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I have to keep uh, lesson one uh, in mind before I implement uh, advice number two. Uh, with that, we are talking so much about advice and everything that we've learned. What is, what do you think is the most overrated advice in business that you hear? Maybe what you already said, number two. Yeah, overrated advice. I mean, I, I would say uh, um, uh, I've not thought thought of this very well, but uh, you know, I think uh, um, most people talk about to build a great business, you need a very highly experienced all star A team, right? While it is true in a lot of sense, and in fact, my previous answer was about building a, a good team. What you really need is a great team. And in that great team, what you really, really need is one that needs you, you really need to instead focus on building a team that shares the vision of what you're trying to do is highly collaborative in nature and is known to have worked together in the past and has a fantastic execution capability. You know, if you look at uh, Messi and Ronaldo on their own, obviously they've all scored uh, the highest number of goals ever, right? But as far as a, winning a World Cup is concerned, they have not, right? So I think um, it's more important, uh, you know, it's less important to win the battles, more important to win the war. I mean, you need that team that can actually make things happen together in a very collaborative fashion and, and can help each other to a very large extent. Yeah, I hear what you say, but I still feel like this is the most challenging thing to do, right? To, to understand that and to implement. So again, uh, great input. And now I want to have, ask you another question about Wadwani Foundation. Can you share a recent initiative with the audience um, that by Wadwani Foundation, which has supported women entrepreneurs? Is there something that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of examples, but I mean, I can share one very, very recent one. And uh, uh, we've always taken the effort and initiative to empower women, I mean, throughout uh, our life cycle. Uh, we've not done enough, I must say, I must confess, um, we could do more. Um, but recently, for instance, our, uh, one of our flagship initiatives is called National Entrepreneurship Network. And here in collaboration with IIM at Nagpur, um, recently, we launched a very special cohort of women founders. Um, and, and basically, uh, you know, we work with a lot of incubators um, in a variety of different universities and colleges. And this was part of the IIM Nagpur cohort of uh, in entrepreneurs that were in, the, um, in their incubator. And what they will get um, is to the, the ability to get to learn about maximizing the startup success. Um, and also enabling them to reach uh, to an investable stage. Um, we'll, of course, through their life cycle um, of the, those um, 14 weeks that they are with us, they are part of our Ignite and what we call as liftoff programs. We will provide them with one-to-one -one mentorship and uh, some level of access to funding because a lot of times, you know, when you're, when you're a startup, very early stage startup, you tend not to spend money on consultants and, and service providers that can actually provide you a tremendous amount of value. Sometimes even mentors might give you pro bono advice, but then for certain things, they obviously have to charge because it, it's more of a long running thing. We also want to have the ability to actually fund that part of the expenses of that particular consulting fee that the, the service provider or, or a mentor charges. You know, service provider example would be a digital marketing company um, that um, you need to 
sort of um, get your website ready and then be able to start doing organic marketing out of that. And then so we provide some of that. So that's that's a recent example. I, I love anything that is about cohorts, incubators, accelerators. So I, I love that, you know, you're doing so much in this space in terms of the education learning uh, support um, that is uh, required at this stage really for women to be able to, you know, like you said, lift off or take off into the next level. And with that, I want to bring, as we come towards the end of our interview, back to you. What does a day in your life look like? Oh, what does a day in my life look like? Okay. Um, well, it depends upon which era of my life. Uh, they've all, always been very, very different. Right now, I guess. <laughs> okay, so so right now, um, I'm suddenly very fascinated um, with yoga um, because I play golf uh, and I think uh, I, my wife pushed me to doing yoga and, uh, uh, and, and you know, it's tremendously helping me to improve my game of golf. Um, so I'm, I, I start my day with yoga and it's very th therapeutic and I enjoy doing that. Um, and then um, once uh, I, I do intermittent fasting, so typically I, I have a you know break in eating food for 16 hours. Um, uh, we, we are basically work from home for about three days out of um, um, five days. Uh, uh, only two days is at work. Um, so I tend to keep all my reviews and all my meetings on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I'm at work. But other than that, I speak to a lot of customers, a lot of our beneficiaries, just to understand their pain, their, their um, reason for attaching themselves with us. Um, and what is it that we can do better for them? Um, so th that, that's an important aspect for me. And it has always been throughout my, my life because I think it's really ultimately the customer's pain point that you're trying to solve in whatever you're doing. Uh, and that's what you do. And, um, and then I said, uh, like I said, I mean, uh, team building is, is of course important work from home doesn't really uh, help uh, resonate a lot with that but we try to do a little bit here and there uh, and I like to participate in that uh, to a large extent and then um, in the evenings uh, um, you know I have uh, started one day a night uh, uh, that I uh, do a Gita class a Bhagavad Gita class and that's um, you know um, uh, you know that's that's been fascinating we have a fantastic uh, person who teaches us uh, very similar to what uh, um, you know we all do I'm a very normal person but but teaches Gita and she does it in a fabulous way so love it uh, very fascinating I love this question and uh, finally a motto that you live by or a favorite quote it could be either, either or I have a few favorite quotes but I think uh, at this uh, um, uh, at this juncture I think um, I like uh, this one which is age is just a number and um, I'm, I, you know, and, and particularly because I, we, we spoke about a lot of the startups and uh, I mean, if you look at Falguni Nair, for example, right, she started uh, her Nika um, at 50 and today she's 59, has taken Nika public, uh, full of grit and motivation to take it to the next level um, and, and actually closer home for me, um, the chairman of our foundation, the guy, um, the person who's actually putting on all, all, all this, um, uh, you know, funding into the foundation, Ramesh Wadwani, he's, um, he's 75. And believe you me, he has more energy and passion uh, that I've, I've not seen in most people that are around me right now, or myself also. Uh, so so it's, it's fascinating. So I think age is just a number. It's just uh, uh, that there's so much time that is there to be able to do so much at any phase of your life. But with that, I think that's a great uh, quote uh, to close our conversation with. Thank you so much uh, for your time. I was going to actually ask you, I see a ton of books behind you. I'm an avid reader and I was going to ask you, what's your favorite? But, um, you know, if you'd like to share that, of course, I'm sure you have many. Everybody hates that question. All book readers seem to say there are many. Yeah, you know, these are all books uh, that I used to read, um, but now I've moved to Kindle. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I keep lying to uh, because I work with a lot of startups and, and uh, to also with SMEs and, and with the changing world uh, that we are in right now. Um, there is a, a book uh, by Eric Rice, uh, which I think uh, a lot of people um, 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 in, in the startup world have read and it's called Lean Startup. I, I keep lying, um, going back to it once in a while uh, because it's, it's so critically important. Uh, 
And the other one that I, I don't remember the author, but I'm reading it uh, right now is uh, uh, Spirituality in Golf. Um, and it's a very interesting um, story. Sure. All right. And with that, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time. I've enjoyed this conversation and I hope you have too. And I hope our audience has a lot to take away. There's so much that you've shared. It's a masterclass. Like I say, each conversation is a masterclass in itself. And of course, I will be sharing all the links of Vadvani Foundation as well for our audience to connect, get in touch and see if they can contribute, be a part of the story, be a part of the growth story of uh, the foundation as well and other entrepreneurs. With that, thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here with me today uh, and, and th thanks to you Savita I think really enjoyed talking with you and great questions thank you very much for that and um, hopefully uh, the audience can take away a few points here and there